Good evening, everyone. Um, I hope everyone's doing well. Welcome to our open house fall 2020. I know this is not the most conventional of doing this, but um, this is the best we could uh, do right now. And we hope that everyone has a smooth uh, open house with us. Uh, today with me, I have uh, Barney Harris and Professor James Davis, amazing people uh, that have been working extremely hard uh, with the institution uh, with us. I'm super excited for everything they have to tell um, all of you guys uh, and the event they have set set for you guys today. So hi, everybody. Um, my name is James Davis and I'm a professor in the English department at Brooklyn College and um, I'm the deputy chair for graduate studies and it's a pleasure to see you here on this meeting um, and um, I'm going to ask my colleague Bonnie Harris who's the coordinator of the MFA program to introduce herself and then we'll um, get into some logistics for how this um, awkward but brilliant session is going to unfold. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm Bonnie Harris and as James says, I'm the coordinator for the MFA program and I am also an instructor at Brooklyn College. I teach here as well. And so I, we're here. The way that this session is going to work, I think, is that there, I think there are more people here who are interested in the MFA program and so you guys are going to hang around with me and the people who are interested in the English MA program or in the publishing certificate are going to go off with James to another room and then we will proceed. I also have with me um, Avi Cummings, Anna Langman, and Ari Knox who are current and or current students and or recent grads who are here to answer questions about the program for, uh, for applicants. So Ari is a playwright Anna is a playwright and Avi is a writer of fiction. So uh, that's, that's where we are. That's what I've got to say. So let me ask, I think the way that we had um, conceptualized this was to, um, to see if like that, I would drop a different Zoom link into the chat for people who wanted to talk about the MA program rather than MFA programs. Um, Bonnie and Abdul, is that the best way to handle this or, or should we try to do a breakout room within this session? Um, is it too awkward to send people off on another Zoom like rabbit hole? Um, I think either Woodward breakout session I think would be the most ideal way of going about it. So create a breakout room and, and, and um, then, um, okay, and then how would we handle uh, um, sending people into that room? Forgive us, folks, we've got to work out the logistics. They would just select the break to go into. Um, okay, so, all right, so let's see if we can do that. We would need two rooms, right? Just well, one everybody room. for the MFA could just stay in this main room. Um, okay. I don't see, I'm not seeing an option for me to create the breakout room though. It seems that it might be easier, James, I, I, I hate to chime in here, but it seems that it might be easier if you just had a separate Zoom link and then people could go as opposed to us having to put them in the room, which is what I think has to happen with the breakout room. Right. So this way, people, if you had the second room, people can just self select and go over there. Um, okay, we can give that a try. I mean, they'll have to, they'll have to leave, have, they'll have um, to leave this Zoom and get into a new Zoom. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, before, before we do that, can we uh, take a poll of everyone that's here? I'm going to shoot a poll on the screen. Okay. If you're using a phone, you might not be able to use the poll. So I'm going to send you a link to fill out the form.
Can everyone see the polls on their screen? Perfect. This reminds me actually of an important uh, topic as well. While we're doing this poll, let's all uh, remember to vote this year as well. <laughs> important time. Um, let's, let's make it count. We have 51% of a poll in. Okay, so I dropped into the chat uh, a link to the MA programs uh, Zoom. So hopefully it's not too awkward and uh, we see one another, those of you who are not here for the MFA program, we see one another in the, uh, in the other Zoom. You could either click that link or copy and paste it. Um, and I hope to see you on the other side. <laughs> Well, if not, just come back, right, James? If, if, right. if people don't show up, just come back and Bonnie. we'll Oh, no, I think I just out. ended the poll. Wait, let me relaunch the poll. I didn't mean to. Do we? Do we... Okay. Um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this and go then to the other Zoom, and I hope to see some of you there to talk about the master's programs and the publishing oh. certificate. Okay. Great. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, I think that what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out, I have a PowerPoint. Um, and so that has just some basic information about the program. And so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly and then we will take questions. It's not, it's kind of free form, but I just wanna give you some background information about the program so that you have a general idea of what it's like. So here goes. Okay. I should have had this immediately set up, ready to go, but I didn't, sorry. So go to the beginning. Okay, so um, my background actually is in the library. This is where we would be having this meeting if we weren't in virtual world. So this is the Brooklyn College Library for those of you who haven't been to campus. And then this is the main quad. So we're here to talk about the Brooklyn College um, Bay in creative writing, right? Um, there are three genres for the MFA in creative writing. There's fiction, there is playwriting and there's poetry. Um, I've got to get rid of this poll on my screen because I can't see anything else. Um, okay, so it is a two year, 36 credit program. Um, there's only a fall semester start, right? 36 credits because you will be taking three courses a semester. Each one will be a three credit course. So that's nine credits a semester, four semesters for 
the math challenged among us, including me, that's 36 credits altogether. Um, so it's a fall only start. So the next possible entry point would be in late August of 2021. Um, you take three courses per semester. This is typical. There is some room for maneuvering in terms of this. So there are probably some people here on this call who didn't do it quite this way, who took two during this, you know, school year, the academic year, and then took maybe the summer. Um, this is one of our readings in the Barker Room. So in fiction, we have 15 students per cohort each year. In poetry, 10 students per cohort each year. And then in playwriting, we have five students per cohort. So um, there are a total for each year, there are a total of 30 students that will be admitted into the program, will enroll in the program. So at any given time, there are uh, 60 students between the two, uh, between the three different genres and between the two years, right? First year and second year students. Um, this is Boylan Hall where most of the classes are. So degree requirements, um, three courses per semester. Those three courses are one workshop, one tutorial, and one elective. So workshop, I think, is self-explanatory, right? Um, many of you will have been in creative writing workshops previously. Um, if you're applying to this program, you, you might very well have some experience with workshops. Tutorial is, um, in, in both playwriting and poetry, a tutorial is an individual meeting with an instructor. Um, it's one of the unique things about the program, I have to say, is this level of individual attention. And so uh, poets and playwrights have two years of this. And the tutorials meet generally about every other week. Um, throughout the semester and what do you work on? You work, you decide what you wanna work on. Um, there are people who have decided that they want to just read a particular type of work, the work of a particular poet, of a particular playwright. Um, people have explored you know, social justice issues with their tutorial instructors, all different kinds of things. It's very open to what the desire is of the student. Um, Fiction students have tutorial, individual tutorial in their second year. The first year for fiction students, the tutorials are group tutorials. Um, and so it's, it's slightly different, um, but that's, that's how it goes for fiction students. And I, I'm a graduate of the fiction program and I have to say it was really quite wonderful. Um, the elective can be any, um, graduate level literature class. So people will take things like, um, I took a course in Dickens and James when I was here. People take, you can take all kinds of things. You can take, um, I'm trying to think, who's taken an elective, a literature elective? Ari or Avi or, yeah, Avi what? Um, I did a Virginia Woolf survey with Ellen. Mm -hmm. and, um, a class at the grad center that was on gothic lit. Yeah, cool. Um, and so, yeah. And so, Ari, did you do uh, to, uh, an elective? I did, but it wasn't a literary one. I did Korean art history and somehow that worked for my playwriting major. That's so cool. Uh, and yeah. so that's one of the other options with um, the electives is that you can take a graduate level class in other humanities departments, in art history, in music, um, in a variety of things. Anna, did you take, what elective did you take? I'm taking uh, Ulysses, the Ulysses five person tutorial with Ellen right now. Yeah. Uh, last year I did a linguistics course. Uh-huh a course called The Sounded Word about um, audible art. Yeah, that's what they that could writes, be heard. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so there are so that there so that there are upper level le uh, level literature, graduate level literature electives, graduate uh, human graduate level bleh, level humanities <laughs> humanities electives. And um, both Avi and Anna, I think, are talking about these small group 
uh, electives that were that they were arranged with people who had similar interests, right? So this is an option that you have. You can find you know four or five people and an instructor, and you can do uh, an intensive look at something like Virginia Woolf, right? Um, there were students one year who decided they wanted to read War and Peace um, for a semester, and they found an instructor to do that. The other electives are called intergenre electives, and those are offered generally about once a year. And um, the sounded word was one of those. So it was essentially taught by it was taught by a poet, um, but people in any of the three different genres in fiction and playwriting or poetry could register and take this. Hence, there's a kind of crossing over of the genres there, and so that that's another possibility for an elective. The other great thing about CUNY is that it's part of uh, Brooklyn College is part of the CUNY system. And so you are also allowed to take electives at other CUNY institutions. Um, Avi, did you say you took Gothic literature at the Graduate Center? Right, and so that the, the Graduate Center is the CUNY's PhD granting institutions uh, institution and you are able to take courses there if that's what you wanna do. So there's a huge range of elective options available to you. And it's, as I said, it's one of the great things about the CUNY system. Um, Cause you could, you not only at the Graduate Center but at Hunter or any of the other um, colleges, Queens College, any of the other colleges that have graduate departments, the CUNY colleges, you're able to take a graduate class there. I wanna go forward here. Um, Mm -mm -mm. This is okay. You then there's a you have to write a thesis as part of your degree requirement as well. And so for fiction, it's 100 pages of fiction. It could be a collection of short stories. It could be a novel, all or part of a novel. For poetry, it's 50 pages. And for playwriting, it's a full length play. I think it's also possibly can be two one act plays. Can you go and do you know about this, Anna? Are you sure? Do you know? Because you're a second year. I haven't heard about the two one act plays, but it's also uh, everything we do was quite individualized. Um, so I, I won't say a hard no to that. <laughs> right. And so I think, well, this, this is something this is something to discuss. It's done in your, you know, it's a capstone project, essentially. So it's done in your second year. And so once you get in, you have lots of time to discuss it. Um, but it's a lot. It's a substantial. It's a substantial project. Now, if you're in the program, you'll be generating a lot of work. And so you're, you know, I've never heard of anybody who went, oh, my God, it's, you know, this thesis is due tomorrow. I only have three pages. You know, <laughs> that's not the kind of thing that happens. So um, anyway, yeah, but it is a degree requirement. Um, there used to be uh, an exam, but they've done away with that. Um, okay, next. Okay, so the program director is Joshua Henkin. That's a picture of him there, is the director of fiction. Um, Julie Agus is the director of poetry. And uh, Christina Satter and Anne Washburn are the directors of playwriting at the moment. Um, we've had a change in personnel because we had um, Mac Wellman and then Aaron Courtney for a long, long time. And now there's been a shift. So we have new people coming in, which is, I mean, the playwriting program is fantastic no matter who's running it so and you know everybody that that's been running it has just been terrific so um that's the lily pond um outside of the library which is another sort of lovely little spot on campus it's you know i'm so sorry that you guys don't have a chance to come out to campus because i have to say um when i first came out there, I was like, this is in Brooklyn. I was, I was some completely blown away. It's like this little garden spot um, in the middle of the city. It's really quite lovely. Um, so then there are opportunities and programs at uh, Brooklyn College in the MFA program and beyond. Um, so there are teaching opportunities. Um, you can teach freshman composition. So you have to take a required pedagogy elective first. Um, if you have experience teaching at the college level, you might be able to avoid the pedagogy elective, but it's a, it's a pretty hard and fast rule. I mean, there, there every once in a while, there's somebody who gets away from it. But do any of you, do Avi or Ari or Anna, do you teach? No, uh, Ari teaches, yeah. And so you took the pedagogy elective? Yeah, I did. I took it with Heidi uh, oh, yeah. years ago. Mm -hmm. 
And so, um, and are you still, Ari graduated um, recently and you're still, you're still teaching? Yeah, uh, I took last year off. Uh, a project that I started in one of my tutorials turned into a Fulbright grant. And so I was able to travel to Poland to continue that project. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was in touch with the English department the whole time. And when I came back, they were nice enough to let me to come back into teaching. So I came back and started teaching again this fall. Yeah. And so um, I, you know, I, I don't have a, I don't have a show of hands. I'm looking at my PowerPoint at the moment, but um, I'm wondering how many people are interested in teaching. It, this is, an, a, a, again, another unique thing about our program because you can attend, you know, some of the other, some of the other uh, programs in New York, NYU or Columbia, or whatever, they'll let you teach one semester, um, which is just long enough to know the ways in which you have screwed it up. Um, whereas um, at Brooklyn, they're very committed to allowing the graduate students, the MFA students to teach at letting them teach because so many people who are writers make their living as teaching, as teachers teaching. And so they are, they're very um, interested in giving you the opportunity to spend quite a long time teaching. Um, I think that their, their aim is to give everybody six semesters, so which is a lot. Um, and the other thing about teaching at CUNY is that it's a large system and that once you're in the system, you have the opportunity to teach at other CUNYs. And so this is a good thing as well. Um, you'll, you'll be sort of in the pipeline of other teaching jobs that show up. Um, so another um, opportunity is uh, the intergenre readings that we have. That's a picture of Ocean Wong, who is a very successful graduate of Brooklyn College as an undergrad. He wasn't in the MFA program, but he was back for an intergenre reading. So this is published poets, novelists, and playwrights who come to speak on campus. And it's twice in the fall and twice in the spring semester. Sorry, I didn't mean to go so quickly back past that. Um, so, um, right, so, so the, the first one is coming up actually on Wednesday. And I can, it, any, this is an event that's open to the public. So I can drop the Zoom link into the chat in case anybody is interested in coming. Um, and I'm sorry, my brain is really fried. <laughs> I can't remember who it is that's speaking. Uh, and it's not just speaking, it's reading from, it's, it's uh, poets, novelists, and playwrights who are reading from their new work. And then there's a Q&A afterwards for students. And so this is another opportunity that happens, as I said, twice a semester. And then um, there's the Brooklyn Review. Do any of you work on the Brooklyn Review? I know some of the people who are coming soon. Anna, you work on the Brooklyn Review. And so this is a literary journal, which is edited and published by Brooklyn College MFA students. So um, Anna, what do you do for them? I'm the playwriting editor of the Brooklyn Review, which I've been um, my entire time at Brooklyn because I arrived as the last editor had graduated. So I just volunteered. And um, I'm also now the vice president of the organization. And so we uh, uh, publish in an online and a once annual print format, the, you know, the best literature that we can find out of our submissions. And um, we do interviews. Sometimes we're starting to get into publishing book reviews and other nonfiction things. We've just uh, appointed new nonfiction editors to begin doing more of that. And right now we're working on putting together a live reading event uh, for some of the authors that we've published. Um, oh, Luna, you're here. Great. I'm so glad you're here. So um, we have another. So Luna is a current fiction student. Um, and so she's Luna Adler, so she's here as well. So welcome. Um, so yes, and the and it's and it's a, it's a review. It has a, a rather illustrious history. It was started more than thirty years ago, um, and Allen Ginsberg worked on it for a while when he was at Brooklyn College, and a lot of um, well-known authors have had work published in the review. And it's not. I mean, I I don't know how familiar you are with literary journals. Uh, so it's not. 
for student writing. It is edited and published by the students, but it's to find other wonderful authors and publish their work. And there was something that was published in the Brooklyn Review maybe two years ago when Jivin was there, I'm not sure, that won um, quite a prestigious award. Um, one of the, like a Penn Award, so a Penn Faulkner Award, but I'm, I'm not, I, I should have, I should have had this information at my fingertips. But in any case, if you have a journal where you're just publishing what the people in your cohort are writing, then it becomes more like a vanity press. And that's not what this is. It's a serious journal. So, um, and we're always looking for people to, who want to come in and work on it uh, because we did have a couple of years where it didn't get published <laughs> because we weren't, we weren't quite organized enough. But so we, we're, um, we're very excited that it's doing so well at the moment. Um, now, let's take a look. Um, we also have, there's Lena, there's Anna. We also have student readings in the fall and in the spring semester. So we have in the fall, we just have general student readings. And in the spring, we have thesis readings. So I have, these are just pictures. We, there, the readings up until now have been held at this kind of divey, wonderful bar um, in the South Slope called Freddy's. Um, but just to show you that we're going on, we're going on and on, I have some pictures from the most recent online reading we had, we were doing it on zoom so we're you know because we're 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 plowing ahead we're going forward to the best of our ability in this uh in this situation and in this time so um that's all i have in terms of the um i wish i could hide this um in terms of the uh presentation that's all the presentationing I'm planning to do. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to open this up for questions. And you can ask me or you can ask any of the students who are here. We're expecting some poets, but I don't see them at the moment. No? Abdul, am I gonna be able to see raised hands if people are raising their hands? Yes, we should be able to see a body. Okay. Do we have, do we have any poll? Can I ask who is any artist here that, that wants to? Go ahead. Sorry. Yes. Who wants to ask a question? Um, this is Alex. Hey, Alex. Hi. Um, Hi. So I was wondering if any of the students kind of work full time jobs or nine to five jobs and are still able to do this program. So let's hear about people who work from, from our current students. I know that there are plenty of people who work. So do you guys, do you work, Ari? I mean, Ari and Avi have graduated recently, but thinking about when you were in the program. Anna, are you working? I have not worked full time while I've been in this program, but I have several classmates who have. Um, and for playwriting, I can say, you know, it's, obviously a little more difficult, but it's perfectly doable. Um, people complain a little bit about their day jobs, but it's not such a big deal. Yeah. Um, my, my experience was similar. I worked part-time and I think, I think everyone in my cohort was working part-time. I don't think anyone worked full-time, um, but we all did manage to balance it with Part time, and then once we started teaching, that also started supplementing our income as well. So it was definitely doable to work. Avi, yeah, I had the same situation. I worked part time, um, but there were a bunch of people in the fiction in my cohort, and the one, the, the current second years, and the ones who were second years when I was a first year, um, who had full time jobs, and it sounded hard, like it sounded hard to figure out the time, um, but people managed it. And I think um, in some ways, you know, maybe it's like practice for the rest of your life because you probably will have to keep working and writing. So I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, I mean, so um, I in my cohort, I graduated in 2010. I was somebody who took a long time off before going back to school. Um, and I and there was a woman who was a lawyer. And about 
two or three years ago was uh, there was a poet who was a doctor. So people manage, you know, that, that people are, are able to work this out. So um, uh, Martina, what was your, is asking, what was your experience with teaching undergraduate classes? So Ari, I think that's you. Um, it's the best job I've ever had. I love it so much. Like it was the first time I got paid to uh, talk about what I had studied uh, as opposed to like working in restaurants or whatever I was doing before that. Um, so I'm still doing it because I, because I love it. I think it's one of the most rewarding parts of the programs. Um, the pay is not great. I'll be upfront about that, it, but it's better than other schools I've learned, some other schools. Um, and you can, you can make it work. It's not terrible pay. It's, uh, but it does, there are benefits as well, like health benefits after two years, I think, if you're teaching up classes. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I, it's a wonderful experience. It, it also like really puts what you've learned into context, being able to, or like having to, cause you think, you know, things, but then when you have to like say them and put them into clear thought and share them with other people, it, it really shows you how much less you know than you think you do. And so you have to look at like, kind of learn some more to kind of make it all make sense. Uh, for myself, I find, and this was true of the workshop process as well. I find that looking at others, other people's writing, good and bad, really informs my writing. You know, that being, being able to look at things that I think people are doing well or things that I think that people are doing badly. And this includes student writing, which is always less accomplished, you know, undergraduate writing, which is always less accomplished than what you're seeing in graduate classes. But nevertheless, it's, it's really fascinating. It's fascinating. And I think that what, what Ari said, I found that as well, that, that trying to articulate ideas about writing really sharpens up your own view of what good writing is, um, I think. But some people are, you know, and I have to say, I came into the, when I came into the program, I had thought, I am so done with school. I'm coming to do this graduate program, but I never want to teach. I will never teach. And I have an entirely different life than I did when I got to Brooklyn College. It turns out that I love teaching. I love teaching at Brooklyn College. And uh, that, that's, that's what I do now. And so it's, you know, who knew? <laughs> this, is what, this is what turned out to happen. And the other thing, Ari, I mean, is uh, speaking to the, the population of students in the classes, because I find them to be delightful. Yeah, absolutely. Like the students at Brooklyn College are really, really smart. So like, it's not hard. Like the, like everyone is there. I don't know, just the campus has a great atmosphere of, of uh, general inquiry into everything. And I think that that's just an exciting part about being in the classes. And also the department will, after a while, sometimes let you teach other electives. So like this semester, I'm getting to teach playwriting uh, undergrad as well. So that's really not just exciting for me. It's a really big help for me in my career to, to get that experience here at Brooklyn College and be able to apply to teach playwriting classes now at other schools now that I have experience doing it. OK, so we have a question here for the playwrights. Have you been able to make relationships with directors and actors in other programs? Anna and Ari. I will say that um, we have had, I mean, obviously not for some months, but last year there was a mixer that I think uh, some of the students put together actually between the playwrights and directors at Brooklyn College and Hunter College. Um, and then in sort of as a as a way to give some sort of opportunity to the students who were not able to have a live performance at the end of their playwriting time here because of COVID. Um, they were offered a spreadsheet full of different professionals at theater companies in Brooklyn, and they could sign up to have interviews with those people as a way to provide them networking because their plays could not go up in person. And I will say that also when I interviewed 
uh, not as an application interview when I talked to Aaron Courtney, who again is no longer the one here, but who was with this program for many years. She told me before I came in that this program is really about being active in the playwriting community outside the college. It's two years instead of three because they we assume that we already know what theater is and we're going to be going out into the world and working with people and everybody everybody is um quite active even during quarantine um we've been not officially but just a lot of us have been involved in letting each other know about opportunities for online festivals and stuff so uh long story short i would say yes to the question doesn't happen automatically, but that's really what the point is for us here. Yeah, Ari, do you have anything um, more to say about this, about connections that you made, not even necessarily with other programs, but just with the playwriting community and the play producing community in New York? Um, I don't really have that much to add. My, my experience was pretty similar. Uh, my, I graduated in, I guess I was in the 2019 class, so last uh, spring, and so that, or two springs ago, I maybe it was 2018, whatever, whenever it was, uh, it was before COVID, so the way it worked was a little bit different, and we did get the live presentation, um, but there were also meetings we met, I think we had a mixer that was organized by the students with the directors as well from the Brooklyn College Department, and then there was like one or two times where Aaron like set up, uh, Aaron, the former director of the program that Anna mentioned, uh, set up a like meeting where she invited a couple different artistic directors from theaters in the city and they all came and met with us. So we met like the artistic director of Second Stage and like New York Theater Workshop and some stuff like that, which was really cool. There was also, did you participate in that, um, the Weasel Festival at um, yeah. the public? Right, so that that was um, that was set up with in conjunction with the graduate theater department at Brooklyn College, if I recall correctly, mm -hmm. and it was the plays were staged at the were put on at the public theater on Lafayette Street in Manhattan. It was called Bring a Weasel and a Pint of Your Own Blood um, Festival, and so there were different themes each year, and so people had short plays. I mean, they were like 15, 20 minutes, it seemed to me, because um, I went. Um, and so that that was an opportunity that people had, you know, to make connections there. Um, thanks. I am, okay, do, so application advice. Um, Luna, do you have any application advice? Yeah, um, I was told by like a mentor when I was applying that if you're doing the fiction MFA having a novel excerpt as part of it is like a like a secret weapon kind of thing and I don't know if this is true or not but um I, I submitted a like 20 page short story and then I did 10 pages of a longer project that I was working on as like a novel excerpt um and I don't know what I was told is just that it's like um, if it's not great, maybe they, it, like the idea is maybe it'll get better as it goes along and um, you don't really have to like wrap anything up. It's just kind of like a sample of something and it shows that you have ambition to like create something longer. Um, I have no idea if that's actually true or not, but that is what I did. And um, I also, I waited like five years between my undergrad, finishing my bachelor's and coming back. And it was nice uh, in my statement of purpose just to have more things to be able to write about and just more experiences to be able to bring. Um, so I was glad for that, I think. Yeah, Avi, what about you? What? Yeah, I can share. My cohort had a really funny experience where we had all gotten the same advice from a different program because we had all gone to that open house. And then we told Josh, the director of this program, and he was like, don't ever do that for Brooklyn College. <laughs> So oh, I will pass it on to you. But don't, don't, don't do a novel excerpt. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> the advice that we got, oh, was, or the thing that Josh said not to do is like, don't spend a lot of time in your statement of purpose, like talking about the specific teachers in the program and like, and like how, how much they've influenced you, unless it's like actually true. But 
other programs, we, we all received this advice and Josh was like, no, we hate reading that. It doesn't feel real. <laughs> so that was helpful to know after the fact or funny to realize after the fact, because we had all done it. Um, and then the other, the other piece of advice that I got that I, I think is probably true is like to treat your statement of purpose like as, as you would treat your fiction sample um, and like treat it as a piece of writing, um, not like a form that you might fill out for like, or like it's not, it's not the same as like a grant proposal or something because you're writing this as writers to writers. And I think that's good advice. Yeah, I think that that's true. I think that that is good advice. Um, I I think that I, in turn, what who who is chiming in there? Is that Ari? Was that? Oh no, was Abdul saying something? Bonnie, I was just going to say. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, the service is bad, but um, the letters of recommendations I think um, speaks highly about your experiences, uh, who you are, and what you've done. So definitely uh, the letters of recommendations, who you get it from and the gap in between the recommenders, uh, super important. Uh, well, I will, yeah, I mean, I, I actually, what I want to say about, I mean, in terms of the application, the most important component of the application to like, it, it's way weighted on the side is the portfolio, right? And so you can have the most fabulous resume but it's the writing itself that needs to speak for itself um, that, is, that is so very important, followed by the statement of purpose and then followed by every, then followed by the recommendation letters and then followed by the transcript. So that, I mean, I didn't have recommendation letters from writers when I got into the program. And so I think that, you know, but they liked my writing and so they took me. And so that this was, this is, it's really that the portfolio is so important. And one thing I do want to say to everybody applying is that there is no advantage to submitting your application early because nobody reads anything until everything is in house. Right. So the application deadline, I should have put this in the PowerPoint actually is January 15th, 2021. Um, it's submitted online. Finally, it took a long time for us to get there. We were still taking paper applications two years ago. Um, I think, Ari, you probably submitted a paper application, right? Uh, it was nuts. Very expensive for playwrights, too. You got to send those heavy manuscripts off to places. Um, but um, anyway, so there is no advantage to submitting it early. So you are much, much better off bringing it to the highest possible degree of polish before sending it in because it you're not it's not like we're going to read an application in December and say okay we're taking that for, I mean I don't read them at all but saying and uh, you know the program directors aren't going to do that and say okay we're taking that person it just doesn't happen right and it's great to have good letters of recommendation but really the, the they're they're not in your control the way your own writing is right and so you really want to pay as much attention to it and make it as good as it possibly can be. What does this mean? I, you know, it's, it's uh, different things to different people. I mean, people sometimes say, what is it that you're, that they're looking for, that the program directors are looking for, they are looking for the best writing. And so, which is not helpful, right? You hear that and you go, okay, gee, thanks. Um, but the fact is that you have to, I mean, hopefully you have people who, you are have worked with are working with who will give you some good feedback and then hopefully you also have a good sense in in yourself of what's good and what's not good right because on the one hand it's good to take advice but on the other hand it's good to have the courage of your convictions so you need to have a kind of balance between those two things i want to try to get to martina's question besides teaching are there any other career opportunities that the mfa can open doors to specifically poetry now I don't know where my poet, my poet people who are supposed to be here are. Um, you know, everybody has Zoom problems. And so um, uh, Avi, you guys in the fiction program met with agents, right? So. Yeah, that was something we, we did my first year. I work, normally it happens every year, but, um, but it got canceled in the spring for obvious reasons and I think Josh like promised that we would be looped back in in the future, and I trust that we will be. I you know he's good for his word, 
but um but yeah it was um it was kind of I, I don't know if this is what you're asking exactly but um but it was an informal kind of I mean we had an opportunity where we we sat in a room with like four agents they told us about their process it kind of demystified it for us because many of us I don't think any of us had had experience with agents uh, in other cohorts people have have had that experience um and then the agents read i think for each of us read a short story a whole story i think that's my memory it was kind of a while ago and then they met with us for i don't know 15 20 minutes and gave us advice and so it wasn't like we were having like an actual <laughs> like uh like it wouldn't have made sense if anyone like got picked up in that meeting that that wasn't really what it was designed for but it was mainly designed to demystify it and give us a sense of like kind of questions to ask and um what a sense of what the experience is like and i think most of us had a good experience with that um poetry is a little bit different thank you so much poetry is a little bit different because there aren't the same commercial opportunities, generally speaking, with poetry. Um, now, Ben Lerner is one of the professors in the poetry program, and he has been hugely commercially successful, but mostly he's, he's published poetry, but he, what he's published that has brought him the most fame and fortune um, is novels. So, um, so that that's a little bit different. Um, and so I don't know, um, Martina, um, if, let's see, um, what do you mean by other opportunities? Do you want to elaborate on that in any way? What other opportunities were you thinking of? Uh, I think I was just like curious about like what, what other um, job opportunities there were afterwards or besides teaching, um, not anything specific. Yeah, I mean, there are people in the program that have gone on to do all different kinds of things. I think that there are people who have started doing advertising writing every once in a while. We have some of those. And then, um, you know, there are, there are people who pursue their writing um, voraciously, assiduously after leaving the program. And then there are people who pursue it less in, in, a, in, a, in a smaller way. So it's really, it's really hard to know. I mean, is there, is there a career path from an MFA in poetry, um, an obvious career path? Probably not, probably not. Um, I mean, but, there, but people make their way in all kinds of different ways. I mean, and there are people who, uh, uh, there are certainly a, a fair number of people who have gone through the MFA program who have ended up in publishing, right? Not on the editorial side rather than on the writing side, and then who may continue to pursue their writing as well. Writing, I mean, I, I think that if you're thinking that you're going to come to an MFA program and you're going to walk out into a book deal for a best, for something that turns into a bestseller, you should rethink that, right? I mean, because really um, coming into a program like this is about developing your writing practice to the point where then you can perhaps send things out and, and submit them for publication and have them be published, right? So, um, but, but it's, it's not like a vocational program, right? It's, it's just not what it is. It's you giving yourself the gift of this particular two-year program to uh, work on your craft and, and improve it to the extent that you can. Because as writers, I tell this to my students, you're never done, right? There's no such thing as done. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's about, you know, always moving forward and looking at the ways that the work can improve, right? And that's what you bring when you're in the program as well as once you leave the program, I think. Um, okay, so, uh, how do you go about teaching after graduating? Do you find it difficult to teach grade and still complete independent work? So I think Ari, um, Luna, you're, are, Luna, are you planning to teach? Are you wanting to teach or? Yeah, I'm te teaching pedagogy right now and I'm hoping to start teaching either next semester or in the fall. Oh, great. But um, that's terrific. So at the moment among our um, panelists here, Ari is the only one teaching. So I'll give that question to you. 
Um, uh, hey, Yasmin, who's a student in my class, you probably know better than anyone um, that I don't always get my papers back to my students on time. Um, and part of that is that the grading does take, uh, the grading is you spend a lot, spend more time grading than you do teaching, um, which grading is part of teaching. So I shouldn't say that it's something different, but like I spend more time grading than I do in the classroom. And as far as like the, the quality of life balance of like, can I like do other projects and teach? I, I feel like it works better than other jobs I've worked in the past because it's in the same wheelhouse as my writing. It's like, I'm kind of already in that mentality. And so it's not as hard to shift gears to go from grading to writing my own stuff or to writing applications for other projects and things. Um, but generally, I mean, uh, hopefully, uh, your students will understand. Uh, some of my uh, some of my peers from my cohorts are much better at getting it all to work. Uh, I kind of seem like I don't know. I uh, this is a long winded way of saying it can be jumbled, but it works. Yeah, there's definitely a way to to make it work. Um, yeah, I think that. Oh, now we have our poet here. <laughs> hey, Kenya. Hi, I'm Hi. so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I'm very happy to see you. So we had a poet who was asking a question about what 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 happens after the program as, as a po as a poet. And Kenya just graduated, so yeah. Well, it depends on on what you want to do with your degree. Uh, I personally wanted to continue to pursue my education, so that's what I'm currently doing. I'm um, in a PhD program currently. Um, at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. Um, but some of us are still working towards working on our manuscripts and turning in manuscripts. A lot of us are getting published in reviews, um, which is pretty exciting. Uh, but it really depends on, on the person and, and what their needs are. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, Daniel wants to know about the funding. How does it compare to other programs? Um, do the MF, most MFA grads leave with some student debt? Well, I can talk a little bit about the funding. So there are scholarships available and um, you don't apply for the scholarships separately. The scholarships are your application to the program serves as your application for the scholarship. And so uh, there you are with that. And so you can count on getting between say two and $3,000 for your first year of study. Now, that's not very much, but on the other hand, the tuition isn't very much. Um, and some people get more, right? I don't know, I mean, we can talk about, you know, I, I, I don't really wanna talk dollar specifics, but some people get more, but you can count on that much. At the moment, the tuition is, I think four, 470 a credit for in-state New York State and like um, seven something for out of state. So the, what this amounts to is a little more than 4,000 a semester for in New York State and a little more than 7,000 a semester if you're out of state. Um, if you move, you, you know, you pay the out of state rate um, the first year if you're not a New York State resident, but you can um, obtain New York State residency by moving to New York and living in New York for a year. So for your second year, you could conceivably pay the, um, the lower rate, right? Once you've established residency, they allow you to do this. So um, as I said, there are a variety of scholarships that are available and the teaching, you know, the teaching pays so you, the, the tuition is about $4,200 a semester in-state and the teaching at the moment for a four credit class, which is what composition is, is about 5,000 a semester. Now, so, so the teaching would cover it presumably, but I do have to say that with, you know, the tuition needs to be paid up front, although you can't, there are payment plans. Whereas the teaching you get paid, we, like with any job, you get paid bit by bit. You know, the money comes in a little bit here, a little bit there. And so um, there, oh, we have another poet right here now. How did you say? So um, in any case, um, so that that's how that works. I don't, uh, do you guys have debt? Um, the two graduates? A very small amount of debt, says Ari. Kenya, oh, three graduates. Do you have some debt, Kenya? Kenya has a little debt. 
Um, yes, but not from Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's good. Well, we don't care about that. <laughs> but, um, so, you know, because the, the I mean, I, I have to say that, you know, so it's about 4,200 a semester, whereas a private college is the programs. I mean, Columbia, I think is 40,000 a semester. I mean, it's an order of magnitude of difference. And so I know that it's a lot, if you don't have it, it's a lot of money. There's no doubt. It's not making light of the fact that there, that it's, oh my God, it's $4,000 a semester because that's a lot of money. But um, in terms of what you're getting for it at Brooklyn College, I mean, I can't say enough about how good the program is. I mean, I really, um, you know, very, 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 very fond of it. Now, let me take a look for fall 2021. Are you supposed to, for fall 2021, are you expecting to be mostly virtual? Now, I'm not, uh, we, I don't think we've gone that far in, in, into fall 2021. Um, I don't think we've even, there, there hasn't even been a decision about spring 2021 at this point. Um, I, there's been some preliminary indicators that there are plans being made to be virtual in the spring of 2021. But I think it's not, it's not, I mean, you know, you, whenever you're in a situation, you think it's just going to continue being that way forever. It's hard to imagine it changing, but it could change. And so we'll just have to take it as it comes and, um, and see about that. Um, now, Heba. When my writing improves, will I become better at editing? Who wants to try? Who wants to try this? Panelists, what do you think? Did you get to be better editors as your writing got better? Yeah, definitely. I I believe that um, being editors of each other's work in in such a, a small workshop space it it does force you to become a better reader of your own work since um all your peers are also working on it but you come become a better editor of other people's works as well um and working on the magazine helps you as well which is something that i did cool um so Daniel wants to know what makes a poetry program unique is the full poetry cohort together in one workshop, Kenya. So what makes Brooklyn specifically different? Sorry, my dogs are gonna freak out. Um, <laughs> um, what Brooklyn is, is amazing, not only because we have amazing um, teachers there, amazing mentors, we get to work um, very close one-on-one -on -one with our mentors, which is not something that you're going to get at Columbia. It's not something that you're going to get um, in Iowa. It's just, it's very different where you can get to work one-on-one -on -one with Ben Lerner or Julie or uh, Monica, which, which is great. And they are looking at your work specifically. And it's kind of like an incubation green room of becoming a better poet. That's something that you're not going to get anywhere else for sure. Um. I also think, um, and so um, Luna or Addie or anybody that I haven't heard from can say this, but my experience at the program is that it's very collegial and supportive um, and that people, that it's, that people are not competitive with each other. It's, it's, it's a small enough program where you're not clawing over each other to get attention from the instructors. In fact, you're going to get attention kind of whether you want it or not um, is, sort of, is sort of the way it goes. And so you don't feel that you're in competition with your fellow students, that you feel that more that everybody is engaged in this project together and how can we best support one another? I mean, that was my experience. So anybody else wanna speak to that? Yeah, that was like a big part of the reason I chose this program, I feel like a lot of programs are known for being very competitive. And when I talked to students and like sat in on the class, it just seemed like so supportive. And um, like everyone was really viewing it as this incubation period and they weren't trying to compete with each other during that time. Um, and I feel that now being in the class, like everyone just seems really excited about each other's work and really willing to give each other extra time and talk about things outside of class. And it's just like a really nice place to, to try to grow and like be yeah, um, and Kenya, you feel that it was kind of unheard of, right? That people that people were so close. Um, 
yeah um we got we got that a lot where it's like you guys are so close you guys are supportive of each other's readings and honestly really really good friends these are people that i i don't see them ever leaving my life i still talk to them pretty much every day um and that that's not something that you get at other colleges at other mfa programs it's usually it can be pretty toxic and and we were so lucky that that we just could build these friendships and this this networking um it was amazing um great who else has a question There are some questions in the chat already. Um, yeah, I, th I, th I think I got them all. Did you see some? Do you see them? Or am I, or am I missing them? There's I think someone from, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, no. I was going to say, I think someone wants to know if you need to turn in new work each week for a workshop. Yeah. Um, and I can speak to the fiction program. Um, we go three times a semester. So we turn in um, a short story three times. Um, and that's the short story workshop. Like there's a novel workshop and they do that differently. Um, so we're not, we don't have to turn to work every week, thankfully. Um, but we are meeting each week. And Luna, you muted halfway through that. I don't know what happened. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, I was just saying we don't have to turn in work each week. I think we're all writing a lot each week, but um, we only have to turn in work three times a semester and we um, review other people's work each week when we meet for workshop. And so that's, uh, is that, does that what happens in poetry and playwriting as well, that you're writing reviews of other people's work and so that there's a fairly substantial load of writing that ha has to be done? In playwriting, we write one full length play a semester and our reviews of each other's work are done verbally in the room um so we're that means we're not writing it does mean that you're in class from 6 30 p.m indefinitely till up to 10 30 p.m on tuesdays um but it is uh, in workshop technically one assignment some people make that one assignment 120 pages but you don't need to so for us it's like um you do your thing and then you're good to go so for, the, that, for that class so as I, if I'm remembering correctly, that with playwriting, it's the whole two year cohort that is in workshop together every week. Is that right? Yeah. And so that that's so that's 10 people in workshop together every week in poetry, Kenya, is it it's like the first years are in one workshop and the second years are in another. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Okay, so that that's that that's how it works with poetry and with fiction. Um, well, maybe Luna or Avi, you can explain how that works. Um, sure, there's um, three workshops for fiction because there's a total of 30 fiction students and it's a mix of first and second years, um, which is nice. So you get, you get, you know, people who've been in the program a little longer and people who are newer. Doesn't necessarily mean anyone's more or less experienced if they're farther along in the program. But one thing that I wanted to mention is that in fiction in your first year, I don't think it's happening this fall because Josh is out this fall, but, um, but you'll have it in the spring. Um, you take a craft class and in that class you do have like almost weekly writing assignments and it's a really amazing class. Um, and it's every single week you read, I mean, it's so much reading. So you read a bunch of stories on a given theme, a given craft theme, and then Josh gives everybody a writing exercise and sometimes has you, you know, read a bit of it that when you turn it in or he asks folks to read it after he turns them back. Um, but everybody, like everybody really loves craft and just like, it's such a, even if, you know, with a, a variety of interests in like experimentation versus realism versus you know all the different things you can do in fiction i'm not gonna <laughs> go on and on um it's it's a class that everybody feels like it's like really strengthens their their toolbox so i think it's worth noting well i think it sort of pushes you outside of what you usually do right i mean that's the point maybe yeah 
um, because you have a certain way that you write, a certain thing that you think you write, and in craft, you're encouraged to try try it differently. Um, so the people who do more than one genre, so that there, here's a, this, that's a question in the chat. If people write more than one genre, and if they have um, success, you know, in in other things. So, yeah. I mean, does any anybody here, um, any any of my, any of the panelists, any of you write more than, I mean, I think Kenny, you said you write both. Yeah, um, I write fiction and poetry and I was able, I did apply to both um, programs um, and ultimately I decided on poetry because of Brooklyn College and the opportunities that I was afforded there. Um, but I still, I still publish short stories. Um, I think the question was, um, which one is easier to break into and it's honestly it's it's hard all around it just depends on um it depends on who's reading that day who's who's and and who's gonna like your work um how much you're uh trying to get published how much work you're getting out there it, it honestly depends um on different things there's pros and cons to um choosing poetry or fiction i i'm not a playwright so i can't speak to that yeah, I mean, yeah. one of the things about the playwriting program is that at least up until now, it seems to me that New York was at least a center of play production. And so that there were opportunities that would come your way just by virtue of being in Brooklyn, right, that you might not have um, in other places. And so, and there were, there are lots of people that have had, they're having things produced constantly. I mean, at the Bushwick Star or at the Little Theater at Dixon Place or the Abrams Art Center and all these and then some people like Leah Winkler and Anaka Winkler who had things produced off Broadway. And Annie Baker is a not so long ago graduate of the Brooklyn College Playwriting Program who, who won the Pulitzer Prize. So there are, you know, um, there, there are seem to be, there are a lot of opportunities of, afforded just by virtue of being in New York. Now there's also, I just want to actually briefly share my screen with you this every week. Um, I'm just going to show this briefly. There's a newsletter that I put out called MFA Opportunities and Announcements, right? And this is for, so that this has the events um, that that are going on, different events. Um, congratulations, uh, MFA alum! Uh, an MFA alum it was named a NIFA um, Nonfiction Literature Fellow. We don't have a nonfiction division, but he was named a Nonfiction Literature Fellow. Um, other people who've had publications, then calls for applications, you know, to fellowships, calls for submissions to different reviews. And so th this comes your way once you're in the program, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, this comes your way every week um, with all kinds of opportunities for submissions and applying to different fellowships and internships. Um, and volunteer opportunities so that there, there is a lot we try to, so, uh, you know, I'm the one who's compiling this and sending it out. And so we're trying to look for things that students can apply to. And I've heard from many students that they have applied to things and gotten them, right? And then I hear later that, that they they see it in the application and then they end up in the congrats. I actually have submitted to a couple of things that I've located and, and gotten publication opportunities. So that we're trying to um, do what we can to show our students what's available out in the world. Of course, we are relying on people to do some of this on their own, to take, to take a look and see what there is. It's not that this information is uniquely available to me to send around. It's available out in the world. Um, now, Kate wants to know if any of the playwriting students have been able to take electives in the film or theater departments. Addie, have you, what are you taking for an elective this semester? Um, I'm taking a translation class with Monica De La Torre that's oh. in my mind. So, so I can't really answer this question. Nothing um, in film. Or, yeah. My understanding is that you can take electives in theater and film, but I have not yet. Yeah, Anna or, or Ari, did you take any film or theater electives? I haven't, but I have a classmate who took, um, a film elective down at the Navy Yards. Noel, right? Noel, yeah, she, she found a way to do a film elective as part of her credits for Brooklyn College elsewhere. I don't remember exactly where, 
It's at the Fierstein School. There's um, that's the that's the newest component of the MFA program. It's supposedly part of Brooklyn College, actually, although it's at the Navy Yard. So it's the her, uh, the Fierstein. I keep wanting to say Harvey, but it's not Harvey. It's Barry um, Fierstein School of Cinema, um, which is over at the Navy Yards, and that's a film program. You know, that's run by CUNY, and they do have screenwriting classes, and it is sometimes possible. To, to take an elective there. Uh, Noel was very enterprising about getting this going. Um, I've given people contact information to reach out to the to my counterpart over at that program. And some, some people have had success and some people have had not had success. And I don't know why. I mean, I think that there may have been a problem this fall because of everything suddenly being online and that that you know, might have been an issue with people then being able to register for the course. Um, and it's definitely possible to take electives in the theater department. Um, at Brooklyn College, for sure, the graduate theater department. So, um, but we just don't have anybody who's had any experience doing it. Um, special permissions needed from department heads to take electives and any other humanities courses. You just have to get permission from the instructor. If the course is in full, um, Martina, you can just walk into it, generally speaking, as long as, you know, there's, um, you can only do it, I think you can only do it for two of your four electives, I want to say. But they can be, maybe it's three, it might be three of the four. You can't take all four. I know that outside of the English department. So um, who else, what else? Have I missed anything over here in the chat? I'm taking a look. People can just speak um, if they want. I see that um, some question and comment in the thread about um, having anxiety coming into F MFA programs. I will say, uh, so hello, I'm Addie. Sorry, I joined late, um, but I'm a first year. So I'm in my first semester in the playwriting program. So, you know, I have only two months to speak to so far, but I think one thing that I'm already finding very helpful is, um, I think that having a cohort of people who are all roughly at your kind of level, but are, as you come to understand, like all aiming for something slightly different in their writing and in their careers kind of helps you to locate yourself and figure out what, where you fit in or like what your niche is. Um, so I'm coming from being like very embedded in the local Bay Area theater scene for 10 years before this. And I think um, like wanting to find new collaborators and new contexts, but not being quite sure like how I fit, where I fit outside of the Bay Area or in the New York theater scene. And so I feel like just starting to get to know like the ambitions and of my classmates and what types of theaters they want to work at or they want to work with um, is helping to clarify for me kind of what my strengths are and what my path is. So I will say that to the, to the anxieties question. Thanks. Um, how many times a week will we be attending class or workshop when you sign up for fiction? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so workshop meets once a week. Um, all classes basically at the graduate level meet once a week. So except for the tutorial in fiction the second year where you're having an individual meeting and that's about once every other week, right? This is right, Avi, I'm not, I'm misspeaking there. It's five times during the semester. Five times during the semester, okay. So it's, it's once every two to three weeks um, is how it goes. But all the, generally speaking, the courses meet once a week. So this is why people are able to continue working and to have jobs and, uh, Addie, are you working? Uh, part time right now. You're working part time, yeah. Most people work part time. I would say, you know, that there there are people who work full time, but most people probably work part time. And so the classes, the um, the poetry workshop meets on Monday evenings from six thirty to nine fifty. Is that right, Kenya? Um, and then the playwriting workshops meet on Tuesday evening from six thirty until whenever they're finished, and the um, fiction workshops meet on Thursday evening from 6.30 also kind of to whenever they're finished, pretty much. Um, uh, Josh Henkin, who's the director of the fiction program is particularly 
dogged in his approach to getting every last morsel out of the out of each student's writing and so he the, i guess that those those workshops have been known to go till midnight i've heard um and that's one of the wonderful things about the program also i think is the um the way in which uh the instructors are really devoted to teaching in the program they're not there you know, just to, they're not, they're, they're not there in name only. They're not famous people. There's some of them are very famous people, but they're not just famous people with names on a, you know, on a roster. Um, they're people who are teaching because they want to teach and they are dedicated to teaching and they make themselves available to their students. And there they are. Um, and then fiction has, um, a group reading tutorial in the fall and the craft class in the spring or vice versa. I can't remember. Um, or you know, the group reading tutorial, they're both in the fall. So, so right, Avi, they're both in the fall. Generally, group reading and craft are usually together in the fall. Yeah. Yeah. And they're each and they're each once a week. This is again for fiction. And then in the spring, there's another uh, group lit tutorial, and that's once a week. And then the electives are once a week. So you can arrange the electives and the tutorials, if it's an individual tutorial, at a time that is convenient for you, right? Um, so that you're not, you, you can take an elective that meets at a time that is the time that you want to meet. Now, if you want to take the pedagogy elective, it meets at 4.30, from 4.30 to 6.10 uh, on Tuesdays. And so you would have to be able to either not be working that day or have an agreeable boss or somebody who would let you out, um, you know, um, for a little bit early. So, okay, Anna, I want to say thank you to Anna um so much for doing this i mean we're gonna um if we don't have a i want to think about wrapping up probably in about you know the next five to ten minutes so ask your questions ask the questions that you have how difficult is it to get into the mfa program well um we have about i don't know we're we're going to end up with 30 people and we have about 400 applicants maybe for the spots so it's pretty competitive um, and uh, you know, but all MFA programs are competitive. Well, the thing that I always suggest to applicants is that if you are committed to doing, doing this, if you really want to go to an MFA program, do not just apply to Brooklyn, right? Apply to a lot of places. I mean, the same way that when you're reading other people's work, you don't like everything, right? It's not predictable who's going to respond to your work. So um, you need to give, if you really want to do it, you need to give yourself the best chance of getting in. So if you feel like you have to stay in New York, apply to all the New York programs, um, or at least look into them and see, you know, what might be a possible good fit for you, because it's certainly competitive and that you really want to give yourself the chance Kenya applied to 12 places, see? Um, and so people apply to lots of different places and that's that's a reasonable approach, assuming that you're not limited, you know, by the application fee. Um, it can get, you know, Addy applied to seven, interviewed at four, got into three, good for you. Um, and I think that um, the, uh, the application fee, unfortunately at Brooklyn College, it, it's not, they don't waive it. I wish they would, I wish they would, they reduced it not too long ago from $125 to $75, which was good. But the only way you can get the fee waived is if you meet uh, some set of very specific requirements. Like I think that um, military personnel maybe get the fee waived. I mean, there's some strange <laughs> classes of people that don't have to pay the fee, but generally speaking, you have to pay the fee. I mean, and ours is, the tuition is fairly reasonable, but the, the application fee is on the expensive side, even, even at $75, you know, with those $75 as a reduction. If from, there is a situation where application fee is the biggest barrier, do email us um, and then we'll definitely take that into consideration to make it. Well, yeah, you can try email. You know, I, I, in the MFA department, we are not in the position of being able to waive fees. We would waive them all. We wouldn't charge anybody an application fee. And so you would need to approach graduate admissions directly and ask them. Um, and then Ari said you, he got, um, they got re rejected from Brooklyn College multiple times before finally getting accepted. And that's true that a lot of, and this is, seems to be particularly true of the playwrights for some reason, that um, 
people, you know, apply and then apply again and then apply again. So a rejection year one is not necessarily a rejection year two. Um, that, you know, there's the possibility of, of submitting different work, of, improve, of improving and then getting accepted the next time around. Um, yeah, Addie is saying um, Hunter, you know, consider, consider Hunter um, for playwriting as well. And Hunter has a very, very good, Hunter has a very good MFA program period. It's really good. For fiction though, it's, uh, it's fully funded. I think it's fully funded all across the board. And so it's extremely competitive because if you don't, people want to go the place that they don't have to pay any tuition. I mean, it's like a miracle, but um, in fiction, I think they take six, you know, um, as opposed to the 15 that we take at Brooklyn College. And so it's, it's difficult. It's, um, it's harder. I mean, and, but again, it's not a reason not to apply because it's possible that there's something about your work that speaks to the person who's doing the reading there. Um, yeah, and Rutgers, Rutgers is, you know, Luna is saying that Rutgers is possibly more affordable and Rutgers is actually part of the state university system in New Jersey. And so it's not a private college, it's a public college. And so it may be one of the situations, I don't know this for sure, but it may be one of the situations where if you're a New Jersey resident, you get cheaper tuition. I'm not positive though, but, it, but also state schools tend to be somewhat cheaper, even if you're out of state. So, um, who else? Anyone else? Last call for questions. All right, so I think we're going to call it a night then. Wait, 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 wait. Um, a separate application for the MFA or is it within the CUNY system? No, you have to apply separately to each program. You have to apply, you know, it's not, it, it's not that you submit a blanket application to all the CUNY MFA programs. Each one is run separately. So you would apply to Hunter and then another application to Brooklyn and then another application to Queens and then another application to City College. Those are the four that have MFA programs. Um, if you wanted to apply to all four of them. City College is a little larger. I think that they have a few more spots for their, their MFA program. I mean, I don't know if it's a larger college. Yeah. Um, and, uh, okay. All right, so who can you reach out to if you have more questions? The, I am going to put my email address into the chat. Um, and I am the person that you can reach out to if you have more questions. Um, I am holding virtual office hours on Zoom. So I am happy to sit um, virtually with anybody who would would like to ask me questions about the program. And as Kenya is very helpfully saying, um, there's a, on the, on the MFA website, there's a talk to a poet function. And then there's also a talk to a playwriting alum. I think they were gonna update that and add a couple of new people in there. Um, and so, um, that's a way of the fiction, the fiction um, does not make their current students available for questions because um, that's the most popular program. And I guess we feel that they, they would be overwhelmed. Um, so, but as I said, I went through the fiction program not so terribly long ago I and mean, I graduated in 2010. So I'm, you know, reasonably competent to answer questions about the program. And, um, that's pretty much it. I wanna thank everybody for coming. I wanna thank the panelists so much for being here and for doing this. It's delightful to have you and to see everybody's face because I'm not really getting to see people. Um, so uh, that's pretty much it. So everybody take care, stay safe, have a great night. Bye.